I'll move on. But let me just say this real quick. If you've got a Bible with you, uh, we're going to be back in the book of 2 Timothy. We're going to pick up where Tracy left off last week. She did a great job, right? Last week, Tracy just did an incredible job. Um, you know, because here's the truth. She showed us, right, that you're going to struggle in life. You're going to suffer. There's going to, whether it's something you would consider big or small, but that's not the end of your story. And there's going to be a better day. And this isn't it, right? Like there's going to be something better. And I loved uh, when she shared about, you know, sometimes just the struggle um, that she dealt with, with, you know, postpartum depression and just having kids and, and navigating life and just realizing like, okay, at the end of the day, you know, not every day is going to be like this. And that's the kind of thing I think if we hold on to is going to really help us for a long time. So, so thanks to Tracy for that. But we're going to pick up where she left off. And let me say this, these verses, when we first read them, um, you might be wondering, like, what in the world is this guy going to preach on? Um, in fact, when I read these verses for the first time on my own, preparing for this series, I even thought, what in the world am I going to preach on? Um, and the more I, I kind of dug into it and the more I saw the heart behind it, let me just tell you this. I really think this is a timely message for us, um, for us specifically, right? There are people who are going through things. There are spiritual battles happening all throughout this church in your lives and in the lives of those you love. And this message, I truly believe you're going to have to walk with me for a few minutes here and help, help figure it out. But this message is going to be so timely for all of us who are dealing with stuff, for all of us who are walking through life and walking through uncertainty and trying to figure things out. This message is going to be incredibly important. Okay. So if you track with me, I promise you, uh, you're going to get something, I hope really great out of it. All right. All right. So second Timothy chapter one, we're going to finish chapter one today, starting in verse 15. Paul writes this. He says, as you know, Everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me, even Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show special kindness to Onesiphorus and all his family because he often visited and encouraged me. He was never ashamed of me because I was in chains. When he came to Rome, he searched everywhere until he found me. May the Lord show him special kindness on the day of Christ's return. And you know very well how helpful he was in Ephesus. Paul's going through this spot in his life where he realizes, man, like people are ditching him left and right. And yet he's found this one guy who really he didn't find, but this guy found him and he's been incredibly, incredibly helpful. And so today, here's what we're going to talk about. Once again, this might not sound super revolutionary, but I promise you it's going somewhere. We're going to talk a lot about friendship and how much that matters. All right. Let me pray for us and then we'll, we'll dive in here. Okay. God, we thank you so much um, for how much you love us. God, I thank you that um, you have an incredible future for us. God, not just us as a church, but for us individually. God, you have a plan for every single one of us that uh, before we were born, you had a desire in mind for us and you knew what you were going to call us to. God, I ask that you would just help us to walk faithfully in that. God, help me to share your word with honesty uh, and also with conviction. God, help us to hear what you're saying. We do believe that you're speaking to us all the time and help us to have the strength and the courage and the wisdom um, to walk it out in a way that is genuine, not feeling like we have to fake it and act like we have everything together, uh, but really walking it out in a way that is, is genuine before you uh, and faithful to your message. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, have you ever just had a bad day? Like just, just one day where you will, you will probably never, ever forget how bad this one day was. It might've been something really serious. It could be something silly, but just a day that was so bad, like it's forever etched in your mind. Uh, I'm going to share one of those days with you real quick. And I promise you I'll be quick because it could take me a long time. Cause this was about 24 hours in my life. My wife and I were living in Inman, South Carolina. You've never heard of it. And that's okay. It was in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we were working at a church there. My wife was working at a school in uh, neighboring Spartanburg, which you maybe you've heard of that. I don't know. But we were taking a break. My wife was going to be in a wedding um, back in her hometown. So the distance between Inman, South Carolina and Ada, Ohio was about 11 hours. Okay. So we had our little goldish mustardy colored Hyundai accent. Uh, we packed up all our stuff, threw our dog in the car. We only had one dog at the time, threw her in the car. And we decided once Katie got off work, we were going to make the trip. We were just going to drive straight through. And so we get through like the little bit of South Carolina we had to drive through and we got through the mountains in North North Carolina because you have to drive through and it's weaving and you're going up and down and it's crazy. And then all of a sudden we start heading closer and closer to the Tennessee border and Katie's driving. And this is rare because she rarely, rarely drives when we're in the car because she's really bad at it. But uh, she rarely drives. She's back there. She doesn't. And she'll agree with me. We just had this conversation yesterday. Um, so we're driving and all of a sudden I hear that sound that maybe you've heard before, uh, the sound of a tire that has blown and somebody's still driving on it, right? So you just hear 
hear all the rubber flapping around and nothing's going right. Now, I'm kind of half asleep, so I hear the noise, and it sounds like it's from the car next to me. So I just kind of lean my seat up, look over, and I'm thinking, I need to alert them to the fact that their tire's blown. Well, I lean the chair up and look over, and I find four faces looking back at me, pointing down at my tire. So it's, it's late, all right? So it's late. So we pull off to the side of the road. I change the tire because I'm a man, and I can do that on my own. Uh, plus, it was a Hyundai Accent. I'm pretty sure I weigh more than that car did. But uh, I change the tire, only to find out that our spare is flat. Now, we are in the middle of nowhere. The closest Walmart is like 15 minutes away. And everywhere that you can go to get a new tire is closed. So we just kind of pull off into this hotel. I ask, hey, can we, can we keep the dog here overnight? Like, is that OK? Because I had never taken a pet uh, to a hotel. They're like, oh, that's fine. It's an emergency, no big deal. The problem with that is, though, like, if you hear a lot in the hotel room, guess how much your dog hears? Uh, so my dog all night is just like pacing back and forth in front of the window. She's growling at stuff, barking at things, like whatever was going on next door. My dog was all into it. Like, she was barking at everything going on. So we get the next morning. We go to Walmart. Uh, we go to their tire section. And we don't have much money, right? Because Katie's a first year teacher and I was uh, not really making much. I was laying floors. So I wasn't making much money at all. So we go, we get the tire changed. No big deal. We get on the road. We're thinking, well, we're just behind like maybe, maybe six, seven hours. No big deal. So we get up a couple hours up the road and guess what sound we hear? A sound of a tire having pops. And I'm driving this time, so I feel it. So I pull off to the side of the road, put on the new spare. And I'm thinking, no big deal, right? We got the new spare. We'll just go the rest of the way. I'll get a new tire when we get to Cincinnati. No problem. And then we get a few hours up the road to Lexington, Kentucky. And if you've ever driven down I-75, um, there is nothing before or after Lexington, Kentucky for probably an hour, it seems like, each way. Like, there's a Sonny's barbecue about an hour south of there. I know that because I used to drive past the school and I go every time. But there's nothing else there. And not, I don't just hear that noise once, but I hear that tire popping noise twice. And so I get out there, we get the tires changed, we go to Walmart, we spend every single bit of money we have in our bank account at this point to get these tires fixed. We get all the way up to my parents' house, and the only thing I can compare it to is like coming home after having been beat up in a boxing match for like three straight hours where you're just sitting there getting punched in the face. Um, Katie goes up, she spends the rest of the time at the wedding. I stay b behind with my parents, broke as a joke. But here's what I'll tell you, that day I learned some incredible lessons like you don't let your tires get bald. Who knew, right? I was 21. Like, you just figured somebody changes these tires, right? Like, might as well just buy a new car if I got to change the tires. So I, I learned some lessons that day. But here's the thing. That, that was a bad day. I'll forever remember that. I learned lessons from it. And that's what we do uh, with, with bad days, right? And here's the thing. As silly as that is, there's some of us in here that maybe you're not just having a bad day, but you're in a bad season. You're, you're in a stretch of your life where it seems like nothing is going as planned. Like, you wouldn't have picked this for yourself. You wouldn't have chosen this for yourself. You are just going through it. And the thing about these seasons in life is this, is they are overwhelming. Can we admit that? Like they are overwhelming. Your temptation, especially in church, is going to be to act like, well, I just roll with the punches. I'm good. I don't need to. Ha it's not a problem. I can handle it. But the truth is this. You can't. And that's OK. Like these seasons in life, these stretches we experience in life, they are overwhelming and they take, oh, they take so much from us. And this is a season that Paul in 2 Timothy is in. If you've been here before the last couple weeks, you've heard this, but Paul, he's in prison for doing nothing wrong. He's in, he's in prison simply because he's leading one of the leaders in the Christian church. Um, he knows death is certain. He's in a, a damp, cold dungeon just trying to fend for himself, and he's alone. He's processing all this pain, but in the midst of this season, here's what we know just from reading 2 Timothy. In fact, if you haven't read the book yet, it's only four chapters. You can probably read it in about 20-ish, 30 minutes, even if you'd really take your time. But what you see is this, is that Paul, even in the midst of this overwhelming, rough season, he's still learning. Um, he's learning about God. He's learning about God's nature, his character, his faithfulness. He's learning about uh, his role that Jesus has given him. He's learning about um, himself. And specifically in these verses that we just read this morning, um, he's learning about other people. See, the bad stretches and bad seasons in life, whether we agree with it or not, here's the truth of it. Given time and the proper perspective, they can be a gift for us. So Paul now has a gift because now, even at the end of his life, even if he understood it before, it's being reinforced. He's understanding people more and more. 
Now, before I tell you what he understands and tell you what we're going to break down for the next few minutes, I want you to understand this. Um, a lot of times when I say we're going to talk about friendship and God's showing you, about, showing you something about friends, we can tend to want to check out because we go, well, that's, I got good friends. Like this, this might not even be for me. But the truth is this. Sometimes, in fact, I'll say more times than you give it credit for, uh, your friendships, your relationships are going to be the biggest determining factor in your walk with Christ. That the most spiritual thing sometimes we can talk about is friendship. Because the people you walk with are going to determine a lot for you. And so here's, what, here's the gift that Paul gets in the middle of this from these, from these few verses. There's some more verses later on I'm sure we'll get to here in a few weeks. But these verses, here's the gift that Paul gets to understand. Is that when life gets rough, your real friends are revealed. When life gets rough, your real friends are revealed. When life is easy, right, it's easy for everybody to be around you. When everything's going well for you and you just, all you do is win and everything's going well. Like, like think about this with sports. Like, I'm a Bengals fan. We've had a few years in a row where our team has just done really, really well. There are Bengals fans coming out of the woodwork, right? The people who haven't had a jersey since the 90s, like, put it on. Like, I've always been a Bengals fan. And I'm thinking, no, you haven't. Like, what are you talking about? This year, we start out six weeks in, we're two and four. Our team's crowd keeps getting smaller and smaller, right? Less people talk about it because we as people, it's easy for us to be around people when they win, but when people struggle, when life gets rough, you start to see who's really your friend and who's really around. This is what Paul is learning. So let's break this down. We're going to break this down into, into two parts. Uh, the first part is this, when life gets rough. When life gets rough. Now, I want you to understand the reason this is so important is because I'm not saying if life gets rough, as if it may or may not. We're saying when, because life getting rough is a certainty. It is absolutely 100% certain that if you live this life, you will struggle. You're going to go through things, sometimes because you made a wrong choice, and you're going to deal with the ramifications of that. But sometimes just because you're living life and other people around you have the free will to make bad choices that are going to affect you. Sometimes you're going to deal with things that you don't fully understand, but they're just part of living in a world that's been contaminated by sin. I know that sounds really like down and, and whatever, like, oh, he doesn't like the world. No, I love the world. That's why we're here as the church, because we love God and we love the world. But the truth is this, we live in a world that's contaminated by the sin in it. This is just part of the struggle we go through when life gets rough, because life will get rough. Now, here's what I see a lot of people who have grown up in and around church is that when life gets rough, maybe you've been taught that life has gotten rough because you've disappointed God somehow. Um, life has gotten rough because you didn't do something God told you to do or you did something God told you not to do. Or life is rough because right now, for whatever reason, you don't have enough faith to get through this season. And if you had enough faith, well, then God would make it better because God apparently, for some of us, we've grown up learning that he's just a genie that gives us whatever we want. And if I rub the whatever it is the right way, like Christina Aguilera said, right, genie in a bottle. Uh, <laughs> That's right. I just moved them hips. Uh, if we do what we're supposed to do that way, then God's going to bless it and we're just going to get whatever we want. So what we've learned is that if you're struggling, you must be sinful. And if things are going well and you are healthy and wealthy, then you love God and God loves you back. Here's the problem with that. The Bible. Okay? Here's the problem with that. Is that if that's the standard we put up for what it meant to be a good Christian is that things don't get rough, then we can literally throw the Bible away. Because even for Jesus Christ, who was perfect, tempted and did not sin, life got rough. Well, what do you mean? Hmm, he was crucified. I, I don't know how much rougher it gets than that. So real quick, let me, let me just paint you this picture about the fact that life gets rough, because I think it's important. Um, from the very beginning, you get the first family in the scriptures, Adam and Eve. They have their first two sons, Cain and Abel. Guess what happens? Cain kills Abel. Life got rough. Um, Moses, right? He grows up. He's an orphan being raised by people who are not his parents. He grows up with a lot of wealth, every single bit of uh, ability that you can get. Moses apparently has it. He's just really well off. Um, he ends up killing a guy because he realizes who he really is, and he can't stand seeing these guys just beat his own people as if they're slaves. He kills a man, lives in obscurity for about 40 years. God sends him back, and it's this great, great account of where he helps lead people out of slavery. But then guess what happens? He goes from the mountaintop of leading people out, out of slavery to then wandering in the desert for 40 years and dying before he gets to the promised land that he was called to bring them to. Life gets rough. Have you read the book of Job? Job didn't do anything wrong. 
Life gets rough. That's just, that's what happens, right? Like life gets rough. If you're a prophet in the Old Testament, they were scorned, they were beaten, they were mocked, they were cast aside from society. Life gets rough. The disciples of Jesus Christ, 10 of them are martyred, one hangs himself, and one they try to kill, he just doesn't die when they boil him alive. Life gets rough. And then you get Paul. And we could keep going. There's so many more than this. But then you get Paul. Paul, his life, if we said that you're only a good Christian if you don't struggle, oh my goodness, we'd have to get rid of everything Paul ever wrote. Because notice here, just, just in this book, and then we'll, we'll look back at another verse, but in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he, he's not just dealing with the pain of the fact that he's in jail, now he's dealing with the pain of abandonment. He says this, he says, as you know, in other words, this is common knowledge to Timothy. Even though they're not in the same city, this is common knowledge. As you know, everyone from the province of Asia has deserted me. Now, I can be a little dramatic, okay? Like, I, I feel things. Um, I, I, I get, like, over-emotional from time to time. So when he says, everyone from Asia has deserted me, like, I, I'm tracking with him on that. Not everyone from Asia has deserted him, but he's dealing with the fact that he's been abandoned by people he was once close with. He even says this thing about um, even Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, we don't really know who they are. We, people have researched, people have studied, but here's what we do know about them. They were likely um, leaders in the church right alongside Paul. They were people of influence within the church, just like Paul. Maybe not as much, but they were close. And when Paul's life got tough, when he got arrested for the second time and they knew he was going to die, people like Phygelus, like Hermogenes, took the opportunity to get as far away from him as they could because it was no longer popular to be associated with Paul. Life for Paul got rough, but this wasn't the first time it had gotten rough. In fact, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to hear this, because if you feel like your life is bad, you can at least point to this guy and go, maybe he had it worse. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this in verse 23, because he's got people attacking whether or not he's really a leader in the church of Christ, whether he really has been called by God. And here's what he says. He's talking about these other people who are accusing him. He's saying, are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, and Ju- the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then, besides all this, as if that wasn't enough, and I'm a pastor, so I feel this last one, okay? He says, then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. So if it wasn't enough that he's being beaten, he's being robbed, he's being shipwrecked, he's being bit by snakes, everything he goes through, he also just has the burden of caring for all these different churches that he started. Can we just agree that life does in fact get rough. That doesn't sound super inspirational yet, right? But I just want you to understand what you're going through, you are not alone now, and you're not alone historically. Life gets rough, and it's probably not because of anything you've done. It's because of the fact you're breathing. Life gets rough rough. Now, that's the certainty we have, but here's the the gift of really what we're learning from Paul, is that when life gets rough, that certainty, your real friends are revealed. When life gets rough, your real friends are revealed. So Paul, he talks about Phygelus and Hermogenes, these two men that have ditched him, and and it's not just them, it's, it's so many people who just don't want to be associated with Paul. They're leaving left and right at the first chance they get because they don't want to be associated with him anymore. And then he talks about this other man named Onesiphorus. How many of you are thankful we don't use the same names they used back then? Right? Like, could you imagine in school raising hearing me like, what's your name, sweetie? Uh, I'm Phygelus. Right? That sounds like a disease. Okay? <laughs> so Onesiphorus, his name, when you, when you translate it out, literally means prophet-bearing or encourager. 
So in other words, just, just by the nature of who he is, his name is designed for him to uh, make your life better. And he lives up to his name in this instance, because here's what we know, is that Onesiphorus, he lives in a different city. He lives in Ephesus. He makes the journey to Rome to find Paul, who he knows is in prison. He gets to the city. He has to cut through all the red tape. And remember, to be a Christian in Rome at this time is dangerous, because as he's walking into the city to find Paul, he would likely have seen other Christians crucified up and down the side of the road. And he might have even heard of them getting torn apart in the arena, and yet he still goes, he finds Paul, he encourages him, another translation says that he refreshes him, and that he's not ashamed of Paul even when he's in his chains. That right there is a great picture of biblical friendship. That right there shows you and and shows me, I really know this, that when life gets rough, your real friends are revealed. When everyone else is running away, your real friends are running in. Everyone else is getting out, your real friends press in. Right, so, so here's, the, here's the question for you. When, when your life gets really rough, are you more or less lonely? Like, do you find people trying to press into your life, or are you sitting there going, man, I wish I had somebody to talk to? When you're struggling through a, a faith crisis and things just aren't going the way you planned and you're wanting somebody just to process it with, are there people waiting to process with you, giving you space but waiting there for you, or are you literally looking around feeling like you are in an empty room? The unfortunate reality for us in 2016 is that for many people, we don't feel like we have one close friend. This is why instead of talking to people, people just vent on Facebook because it doesn't take a friend to comment back and be like, girl, I know what you're going through, <laughs> right? Because that's what we use social media for now. We just kind of vent the frustration, but we don't actually get help. Okay, can I just side note? It's really discouraging when I see 35-year-olds and 13-year-olds posting the same things. Like, can we grow up a little bit, all right? And I'm super immature. Like, I love me a good fart joke, all right? But come on, guys. Let's, let's get real with it. We, we run to something like social media to vent what we're feeling because we think that's where we're going to find somebody to actually, that actually understands us. But what we find is this. Man, maybe we just don't have real friends. Paul has Onesiphorus there, somebody who is cutting through the red tape to be a part of his life and dig in and say, I'm going to be here with you even when it's not popular. And this, my friends, is what makes the church so important. It's because as the church, we are called to be people who press in instead of running away. That as culture gets darker, as people's lives get messier, we don't retreat as if we need to run away and be safe, but we run in. In fact, one of the early marks of Christianity, what made Christianity explode in Rome in this time, is that Rome would go through multiple plagues, people dying left and right. And so what would happen is uh, somebody would take their loved one, who was experiencing the plague, and they didn't want to get it. So they would take their brother, sister, mother, son, daughter, husband, and they would put them out on the streets to die. Christians, though, would go to those people on the street that they had no affiliation to, pick them up, take them to their own homes, and care for them. Christians would run in when everyone else ran out. And now, if we can be honest, here we are, 2016. I think the portrait people often see is the exact opposite. As life gets messy, things get difficult, and so we go, don't want to mess with that. We are called as friends to each other, and ultimately as people who are called to be friends to the world around us, to stand by people in times of adversity. And let, let me say this side note, and, and I know it seems like maybe I'm just constantly like plugging this, and, and uh, as a pastor, I understand maybe you feel that way. Like, if you're not in a small group, I firmly, firmly believe with everything in me you're missing out. Now, I understand maybe your schedule doesn't allow it. I get that. But I really, truly believe if you are not a part of a small group, you are missing out. And the reason is, is because that small group is that point every single week where regardless of how you're feeling, everyone else is rushing in to be right there with you. Everyone else is willing to stand by you in your darkest moments. Everyone else is willing to walk with you when life gets scary. And when other people want to get away from you, your small group's going to press in. That's the importance of the church. But can I tell you, we're not that way just because we're good people. We are that way because we are Jesus' people. We are people who have learned. We are following Jesus Christ. And what we learn from him is that when life gets rough for people, we don't run away. Because Jesus, when life got the roughest, he was the friend who pressed in. 
Now, here's the question we have to address really quickly, is because is, maybe this sounds foreign to you, but the question maybe that comes in your mind is, can, can you really be friends with Jesus? Like, is that possible? Because even if you believe that he came to earth, he died and he resurrected, then you also must believe that he went to heaven. So like, how can you be his friend if he's not physically here? Well, here's how we can be friends with Jesus is because um, we didn't choose him as our friend. He chose us first. In fact, in John 15, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's, he's sharing with them all these different truths, all these different hard things. He's teaching them. And, and here's what he says, John 15. He says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the father told me. Now you are my friends. Jesus makes it clear to his disciples, to his followers, not just then, but also now. Dude, if you're following me, you're my friend. This isn't just a relationship where I'm above and you're below, but this is a relationship where we're walking alongside. And yes, Jesus is Lord, but Jesus is also your friend. He wants to be there with you. And when life gets the roughest, he's not running away, but he's pressing in. So I'm going to have Emily come up and, and play for us. But I just want to share one thing with you as she's getting ready to do that. Because here's what I know. Once again, the certainty of life getting rough, um, everybody goes through it. And so maybe life is like we said in the beginning. Maybe life's rough because of a decision you made and you're struggling with the ramifications of that. Or maybe life is rough because that's just life. And something happened to you or around you or to somebody you love and you're just struggling. I just want you to know with all certainty that if everyone else has left you, Jesus is right there by your side. John chapter 8, one of my favorite accounts in all the scriptures. Jesus is saying, he's speaking to some religious people, some religious leaders, and they decided before they got to this little gathering that they were going to try and trap him. Because what they did is they thought, well, Jesus, this, he's probably either too good to be true or he's a false messiah, and so we have to expose him. So they decide they're going to trap him, and so here's how they do it, is they catch a woman, the Bible says, in the act of adultery. Like they catch her with a man who is not her husband. And so they, they get this woman as they catch her in the act. They bring her to Jesus in front of this crowd. And they say, okay, teacher, see what you do with this one. The law of Moses says that this woman deserves to be stoned. The law tells us that this woman deserves to be killed. In other words, the right righteous thing to do is to distance ourselves from her so much that she can't even breathe anymore. That's the right thing to do. So they kind of aggressively push the ball in Jesus' court. Here's what I love about what Jesus does. Is Jesus stoops down, pretty much ignores these dudes. And he just begins kind of like right in the dirt. And he lets them know. He says, hey, whoever hasn't sinned, you, you get to throw the first stone. You throw the first rock. Launch it. Go for it. Just plays in the dirt. that's so incredible important. Verse 9 says this, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one beginning with the oldest because many times hopefully wisdom comes with age, at least that's what I keep telling myself. Uh, I'm hoping that's true. They slip away one by one beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Everyone else left. This woman who was clearly wrong in the situation she was in because of a decision she had made. This was her fault. And yet, when everything is said and done, there's only one person standing by her side. That's Jesus Christ. If that isn't a friend that we all need, even when we don't deserve it, I don't know what is. So I want to encourage you with this this morning, man. If you are just going through it, this space and time in your life where life is just rough and you just don't know what to do or maybe you even know what to do and you just can't do it for whatever reason. Here's what I want to remind you of is before you take one step, understand this. Jesus is right there with you. And I know as the pastor of this church, man, there's people who are, who are willing and ready and wanting to wrap their arms around you and help you through what you're going through. But 
But even better than that is the friendship that Jesus Christ has to offer. He's not someone we need to be afraid of because even when we do something we know we shouldn't do, he stands right by us. Jesus is the best friend we could ever hope for.